morning and welcome to the UBC Learning Circle, the Warrior Program Model with Dr. Ricardo Menholen. Um, today's conversation is presented in partnership with the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. We'd like to thank the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle and allowing us to have these conversations. Before we formally begin, I'd like to acknowledge with respect and gratitude that I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil Nations. Please feel free to introduce yourselves and then in the chat box below. Um, yeah, and today's learning circle will be exploring the warrior program model with Dr. Ricardo Man Mahon. Um, I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves in just a few moments. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Serene Squawkin. I'm the learning circle manager. I'm Seal Kokushangin on my mother's side and Hickory Apache and Belgian on my father's side. I'll be the moderator for today's discussion and joining us working behind the scenes is Cynthia, our production coordinator and Kira, our pr production assistant. They'll be in the background interacting with everyone in the chat. And finally, before we get into today's discussion, I'll provide a gentle heads up that the topics covered may be sensitive or emotionally triggering. Please make sure that you are looking after yourself and if at any point in time you feel like you need to talk to a friend, elder, counselor, or family member, don't hesitate to do so. We have some prompts in the chat for you if you need additional support. Now I'll turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Thanks, Serene. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ricardo. Uh, I just, Dr. Ricardo, um, it's easier. All the young people that I work with, they can't really pronounce my last name, so they just go with Ricardo. Um, so it's the easier way to go. I um, I live in Tlalquia territory in uh, Nutchucks, also known as Tofino. Uh, and I'm really lucky. I uh, have been really lucky to be a part of, of uh, all of the warrior model over the last eight years as it's, uh, as it's grown uh, really in a grassroots way from the nations themselves. Um, I, uh, I hope from today that you can take away uh, seeds to be able to plant uh, in your own territory and uh, and you know maybe start to grow this. Our program started in uh, in 2015. Uh, I was asked by the health director in the summer uh, to take a look at why the men's group hadn't worked in uh, Itatsu, Yukulit First Nation, Kluthat people, and I walked around the village and and uh, and talked to anyone that would talk to me, elders, youth. Uh, women, men, and started to ask about, you know, what uh, what we could do, what it could look like. Um, I didn't even know what a men's group was uh, uh, eight years ago when we started all of this on this journey. I since have learned that I need one, but uh, but as a part of this, uh, I went back. Uh, I went back to the health director that fall, and I I offered a program that was modeled after my time. Um, in the Army Reserves, uh, preparing people to respond to domestic operations, uh, one night a week, one weekend a month. And I, but the model that I offered and I, I brought forward was based on Nuchanal teachings and centered uh, on, on leadership from a Nuchanal perspective, indigenous perspective. And what happened was the health director said, that's great, can you run that? And I said, no, I'm not the right, person, obviously, I'm not Indigenous. He said, we just need someone with the capacity to do it until we can teach someone. And so I, I took it on and I, uh, I, we started the warrior model one night a week, one weekend a month. But the problem was no men came. And it was only young boys that came. And consistently, it was only one young boy that came and his name was James. And we called it the dark days of just James. And the program was started by him and uh, what he wanted to do out on the land. And, and, you know, when his headphones died and he took them off because we didn't have solar chargers back then, he would tell me what he wanted to do. We could build a trail. We could build a little dock that was out there. It was just us. There was no one else out there with us, but, you know, it was, uh, we just, we kept going. And so uh, I wanted to... Uh, uh, show a video to kind of share contextually, you know, what grew in the first two, two years. Uh, we started in 2015. And, and uh, so uh, the next slide, uh, if you can change the slide for me, Cynthia, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, these are the early years of the program. Yeah. 
My first time at Warriors, I was just playing basketball, and then like I seen a bunch of like kids, and I was like wonder wondering what was happening. <laughs> My mom sent me over to the gym in Hitatsu and you know I saw Ricardo there and you know he's like hey and then that's the first time I ever saw him I think. It's two years ago that I started this. Actually the first thing that I first started that was uh, bow making. So we started the Warriors in 2015. It was based on uh, conversations that we had had with uh, with all of the community members in Hitatsu to talk about what it is that we wanted in our our men, our, our, the men of the community in the future, the leaders that we want them to be. Uh, what emerged was the need to bring them together and start to build confidence. I was approached three years ago that the uh, program wanted to get started uh, with the youth teaching traditional skills and give a bit of background and then I got the detail of it. It was like, I've already done that. Like me, it was more one-on-one, -on -one, but those teachings I already have, and I was like, sure, I could do a lot of things with them, show them a lot of things, gathering, hunting, tracking. The, uh, the ideas, the pillars of the program are, are respect, responsibility, and discipline. So we really want to instill that sense of responsibility in the community, to do things for their community from that place. There isn't much to do in Hatatsu, so for us to be able to go and join in a group and like do things together it like really connects us i think like as the young people we like connect and come out here and you know have good times and like if we didn't have it we wouldn't really be doing much outside of like, i don't know school there there were other things like this like wind speaker and rediscovery it was it was like this but this is this is better because we have discipline because it keeps everyone together and even when someone falls apart they still have something stable to look forward to coming from the community members they they're the ones that see the change I'm hanging around them I see them in the community but it's their actual home life where this path coming out here, what they learn, duties, responsibilities, looking after one another, the camaraderie part of it. At home, they notice a change in their, if I could use the term, demeanor. How they act is, has changed in them, and that's the positive feedback I get from, from the Warrior Program. I've been chosen to like lead a few things out here a few times, and like, you know, I had to like figure things out and how to get people together and like be able to work with them and like, like have good relationship with them so they actually listen to me. These young guys who were kind of the higher up leaders in the group, I would see them eventually taking the roles that all of us adults have right now and leading the group for the weekend saying, hey warriors, we're going out, we're, we're gonna go out fishing and hunting this weekend and doing it themselves. I want the elders to come out here because so we can learn language and like not let it die out. So they want to get the elders out more to see what we've done and they will be proud of what we did for them for the future. For this place, like we're making it like habitable for like elders and stuff. So like I think that we're gonna like work together and like become a team, you know? like. Through that process, we're gonna become like closer and you know know each other more and be like a family, I guess. I hope that what uh, I'm teaching them, they will be in turn. They will be the next leaders that that they are learning that they are the next leaders. This is just their first steps into showing them a little bit of responsibility. I think there's going to be a lot of kids joining Warriors and a lot of us leaders will lead them to a right path.
Thank you. Um, I think it's important to show that video for uh, uh, just for context. If you can slip to the next slide, please. Yeah. There we go. Um, so again, for context, where this program began, uh, you flew that First Nation in Tatsu on the uh, on the north east side uh, of Ukulet. Um, where we went, uh, I don't know if my cursor, I guess my cursor wouldn't work, uh, but uh, is where that point is out in the middle of Effing, up into Barkley Sound, Effingham Inlet. Um, we went out there uh, and there was no one else that was out there with us and the youth didn't know how to be out there. And so we started to teach them how to be out there safely, how to create a sandbox of safety out on the land. And as more youth came, we started to put them in leadership positions. Um, next slide, please. I think it just shows a, there we go. That's what it looks like. Beautiful. That's Effingham Inlet. That's their traditional camp. As a part of this program, we started to uh, follow where they went, where the community went seasonally. So this was one of the locations that was used um, uh, traditionally uh, as one of their winter villages. Um, we should have been finished this when James turned 18, uh, that's four years ago. And, um, but we saw others coming out. We saw more and more youth coming out and, and wanting to be wanting this in their own village. Um, and so I went with the boys, with the older boys to start sharing this model with others. Uh, next slide, please. It's always a pleasant surprise sometimes. So here are the community needs that we started to hear and what this was, what the foundations uh, of our curriculum, I, I don't use that word, we just, their activities, what activities did we do? We wanted that opportunity to connect with elders. They, there was that, there was that intergenerational knowledge transfer, all the big words that I don't use. Um, you know, we wanted to create that space for elders to be able to, to share that knowledge and see what those young people were good at. This, this program, the core teaching was from Richard Mundy Sr. in Ukulet First Nation. We used to listen to our young people and we used to have a place that we could see what they were good at. If they were always down by the water, we would teach them to fish. And if they were always in the woods, we would teach them to hunt. But we don't have a place to listen to those young people anymore. And then he held up his phone and he said, this is why even when we come together, we're still looking at these. And so we found the only way to get away from that was to go somewhere that they would not have reception and then eventually die. Um, no, the, the phones, not the youth. <clears throat> Uncomfortable. Um, so that was a part of what we've tried to create is it a, a places both locally in the villages and also out in the territory that, uh, that elders could come and be able to teach those skills. Uh, next slide, please. Another need uh, that we heard was to be able to build the skills of the youth to be on the land. Um, being indoors as much as people seem to be these days on different devices and things like that, or different reasons not to go out in some of the places that, uh, uh, that villages are, um, they needed to build their comfort on the land and not be scared of being on the land. And, just, and we started small, we started slow, you know, we started with what they wanted to do and it just, it, it continued to build momentum. Often, surprisingly, it kept building momentum. Uh, next slide, please. Another uh, community need or another need that the youth expressed, again, this program driven by youth was to be able to get some cool skills, to be able to, uh, we're getting close to the end of high school. We're not sure where we wanna go, but we wanna try some stuff out and uh, just to be able to have some skills. So getting their power saw course and being able to build a bush cabin. Random things like that um, were, were skills that we brought in. Um, so uh, next slide, please. There we go. Um, reclaiming territory. You see Kayukits jumped in too. That's awesome. I see a hat is on there. It's so good to have, there's so many. Um, Reclaiming territory, getting back out on the land. Cayuca had actually just finished one of their a cabin uh, at you know in the spring of this year, out on uh, uh, Spring Island, a remote location in their territory. 
And so one of those things that we had heard from the villages or from the community was the need to get back out there. But one step further, it's really difficult for us to bring elders out on the land and have them stay and camp on the ground uh, and try to get up off the ground when it's freezing cold, you know, all those pieces. So we saw the need to start to build safe, safe, warm places that we could bring our elders and knowledge keepers to start to teach the youth a good staging area, a good location. And so the youth started to raise their own funding to be able to build things like this in their villages. Um, as we uh, next slide, please. The last uh, key last need that we really, really needed to uh, hear and address was that need to bring our young people together to be able to create one new channel family. Uh, and, and that opportunity starting with the youth was uh, where we were working with the youth. And so we bring them together as one, one, one family that can ask together. And we find a lot more strength in that when we're applying for grants. And I hope in the future when these young people are on councils and, and in leadership positions that you know they'll text each other and ask these questions before jumping to a conclusion and, and, and assumptions in there. And so really that, that was a real need that we saw. We saw a need to create one, one family again, where we looked after each other, one community. And so those were the five needs that this program was really driven on. Um, next slide, please. As this continued to grow, uh, we grew stronger roots. So I'll share. Uh, the boys, um, they finally started to find their voice. They finally started to find what they were good at. They, 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 they weren't afraid to, to lean in on things that, um, that they hadn't tried before. And so for the first time, they started to sing. And so it's their voices in the background of this video, uh, which I just wanted to share um, as the program started to grow. Yo ho we yo ho we yo we yo hey hi yo. Right now we're in Effingham Inlet, and for the past few days we've just been, well, improving on our trail. <laughs> it's so fun. Only two hours, and we already made halfway all safe. We were sponsored by the Clackwood Buys for Trust to host uh, Parks Canada, a couple trail builders to have a, a workshop and uh, to make it safer for elders to be able to, to access uh, the cabin up here. They taught us how, how to make trails properly and how to make them last and materials to use to make it stand out at night. It helps us be more efficient in our tasks. The camp, oh, it's so much better. Like three years ago, with all the mud and like all the nothing to, no dock, no nothing to get up. It was really hard, but it's so much better now with all the docks and all the trails and everything. Well, I don't know that we've really been teaching them that much, but we've showed them a couple of approaches to trail building and really they've figured out the rest. Um, you know, we've found a couple of new, better routes that some of the elders could take to access the camp and uh, you know just discussed a few ideas and from there they've kind of taken it and come up with with everything it's just awesome to get these other organizations to come and take part in in what we're doing here and seeing them connect with the youth yesterday afternoon i was kind of working away and everybody started singing it was amazing well we just start singing you know we just start singing out of nowhere and as you one of us starts singing then we all start start singing it's a lot of fun no, I just think it's a great opportunity and I think if anybody does have the opportunity to take part in a program like this, it's valuable. I just wish more of the, more people in our community knew what was happening out here because it's amazing. Our main goal was fixing up the camp for the elders and we've been like doing other things like archery and learning skills like that while also fixing up the camp. So we just go out every weekend and have fun and do the work. I just seen them, all the kids going down the dock one day and I was curious and I, was, I went over and I said, what the heck are you guys doing? We're going camping. Oh, cool, I'm going to come along. Because it's, uh, 
really healthy for me. <laughs> you know, it uh, clears my mind, and, uh, and I love working with kids and teaching them. Um, I learned not to sit by the fire when you're supposed to be working and stuff. I learned how to chop wood, and I learned how to um, apply some stuff from my medical kit from Jay Miller. We've been, we've been doing some archery, and I, I learned how to run a range, which was pretty cool. I didn't do the video games as much now. Um, outside a little bit more. At the end of the day, you know, we look over what we did, and like, we talk about it. And then, you know, I don't know, it's just nice. Mm, we're a lot closer than we were, as in like, friendship and stuff. I don't know. It's like a bonding experience, really. They're learning how to uh, be responsible. We're teaching them responsibility and all that and you know, I guess we're learning, teaching them and they're teaching us at the same time we're learning off, off each other, the way I see it. Uh, the district principal uh, a few months ago said uh, that we could have high school credits for the program. Because of what this program has been doing, other parents from other communities have asked us if they can send their young men uh, to it. In the next little while, uh, that we can uh, like open two, uh, like one in our like, it and um, uh, I'm trying to get that going because we already kind of got it started. So now these other communities that are, have been sending young men here, or we're working with them to, to launch more programs, uh, to launch their own program that may not be called Warriors, but it's a model like that, a model that, we'll, that we've found to work. And I, it's really neat to be able to think that at least three weekends of the month, they will actually all be coming together, you know? super safe, right? Protect the circle. I see it's a, a, they're going forward and the young kids will take over for me at one, one day, one time. <laughs>
carefully in small groups, but starting it. Um, that was 2020. In uh, next click, 2021, um, we went up to Old Mass to, to Old Mass to start the rooting phase of that program up there. Uh, a rooting phase can take anywhere from three months to three years. It uh, it's it 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 is all driven by the young people and and their want for this. And then uh, as you know, other pieces start to go from there. In uh, 2021, at the end, we also supported the most, the second most southern region or in southern Nuchanop Nation, DT dot. Uh, and then in 2023, potentially, uh, there is conversation for us to be supporting uh, a Hattasit and Uchuklisit, just as uh, Uchuklisit as other uh, potential nations. But we're talking to the young people and council and all of those steps that must happen before, um, just to make sure everyone is shaping this program together. Um, next slide, or next click. What happens next is uh, uh, other nations, other nations in BC that uh, are, are interested in, and wanting to start something and take on all the crazy amounts of work that this takes, crazy amounts of work to do, but so valuable and so important and so fulfilling. Um, they send champions. They send. They they start to identify their youth champions there, their adult mentors. We start to figure that piece out and see what they want to do and how and who is going to influence and how many the the programs they may need depending on how many villages. All kinds of conversations. Um, this model. Uh, and it's great that this is the learning circles funded by FNHA because um, it was in 20, it was actually during the COVID uh, 2020, that uh, one of our health directors, Coral Johnson from Hawaii at First Nation, uh, she uh, grabbed the, the lead and, and led the charge for us to come together as one and work together as one Nuchanoth family, one Nuchanoth warrior family. So the youth come together and train and learn together. And it's because of FNHA and because of Coral and um, and and her uh, <laughs> hope for something different that, uh, that we've been able to finally find sustainable funding. Because for the first six years of this program, we begged anyone that would listen to us, anyone that would listen to us, we would ask for funding to be able to, you know, the civil forfeiture grants that are out there, uh, the new relationship gr grants that are, new relationship trust grants that are out there. Um, we had some really, really good believers in our, whatever we were creating back in those days when we were nothing uh, we, but a bunch of youth and me <laughs> uh, going out on the land together. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Oh, and actually, um, one other thing there too, the downtown east side, there's conversations um, with organizations in the downtown east side. And if anyone knows any that would want to be a part of all of this, um, we're trying to figure out a solution for the downtown east side because the number of communities that have asked us to uh, support their young people that are on the downtown east side, uh, it kind of moves on up a priority list in that case. And so uh, we're currently trying to figure out which organizations that would be and you know, funding models and those pieces, but it'll be a lot of work and but it's such a it's an important one that's been requested by every community we've been in. Um, I think before we go to the next slide, it's also important to note that this isn't my job or work. I work with Chimamuk out of the BCCDC, Jessica Chenery and her team there. Um, they, uh, we do men's wellness, women's wellness, two-spirit wellness work out on the land. And uh, and I'm lucky to be a, a person in the background making sure that that sandbox of safety is there. And I'm grooming these young people to be able to do that in the future. They're doing it locally in their own villages right now. But my hope is that they're working for provincial organizations in the future, like Chimamuk, like the Indigenous Youth Wellness Team, and others that want this type of work in their villages. Um, next slide, please. Great. So 12 month launch approach. Um, this is kind of how we go about supporting a program to be carved out, to be shaped. Uh, it takes 
after the rooting phase, which can take, like I said, three months to three years now um, to, to go through that and find the right people, find the right funding, find all those pieces, find the funding. Um, we start a 12 month launch approach. It takes a full year. We walk with the community. We walk with the youth for a full year uh, to make sure that this program is, is theirs, is rooted, is, is what the, the elders there want, what the youth want, what the, the council, the leader, community leadership wants, the hotway, the, the hereditary um, system as well. Uh, so very important in what we do throughout uh, this model. So if you can click forward, here's phase one, after the rooting phase. Um, this is just a, a high level view of kind of how we shape this. And this will, this has been changing every iteration we've done. It's changed and imp hopefully improved <laughs> based on what the youth have told us. <laughs> so um, it, it is getting better. Um, and so this is how we've done it. We've run this uh, eight times now. And, uh, and so it's created great opportunities for us to fail a lot. I'm a firm believer in failure as learning and, uh, and uh, we can pick whatever word we'd like with it, but it's so important that we fail better. And my young people that I am lucky to, that still want to do this, want to go out in the rains of New Channel territory, uh, although it's snowing today, which is climate change. Um, so <laughs> that's another UBC topic, I'm sure. Um, so training gathering one, we bring the youth together, we bring those youth leaders together, the ones that have been identified by the village, anywhere from six to 12 of them together to be able uh, for, for four days. Uh, and the location will change. In Nuchano territory, we bring them uh, to a location here. It's our stream here in Nuchano, uh, you know, our stream for the fry, the salmon that come from the same stream. They all need to come to this location and be loved. They need to be loved. They need to, to, to see what this model really is about, about a place that you can fail, a place you won't get made fun of, a place that you won't get bullied. And that's what they need to feel. And what we see in the other nations that are grabbing this, their stream needs to be in their location, in their territory where their communities decide. And so phase one will look different based on where it's being run, but that's what phase one looks like. And we, we do team building. Uh, we do program model planning, which is just an, kind of a boring way to say uh, helping them to come up what, with what one night a week will look like, you know. Uh, and then we, we do community-specific topics like addressing uh, addiction conversations. You'll see later on in the slide deck, uh, we bring naloxone training now because it's been requested um, for the leaders. So uh, that's, that's phase one. And that happens um, really at any time of year because the program... Uh, is not uh, rooted in, the, the program is based on the seasons and it flows that way. Phase two, if you can click forward for me, please. Great. So we then spend five months supporting one night a week. What does one night a week look like? What activities are we going to do? Which elders could you bring in? Uh, what, what needs are in the community? Where do they need brush cleared? Or where do they need, um, do they need smokehouse wood? Uh, those are the types of things that we start to do. We start to learn the songs, the stories of the of the territory. The boys bring in um, knowledge keepers, local knowledge keepers. And during phase two, we also uh, bring in some essential training that they're going to need. So we fund, uh, we try to find funding for it um, uh, for essential training. Those those key trainings that we see: a basic wilderness first aid, a uh, basic wilderness survival course, a power saw operator course, so their chainsaw course because then it's not all up to the adults out on the land. We've had 12 year old boys running a chainsaw. Uh, they are capable, they are stronger than I was at that age. Um, and so uh, we also uh, wanna have their PAL. We want them to get their possession and acquisition course. Um, and so we bring in that training um, sometimes multiple times because community members sometimes wanna be in on it. So we'll have it you know, run two days or two courses back to back. That way, if our instructor's coming all the way out to a location, they can you know, make, it, uh, make it more worthwhile for the community's time for them to get out there. Uh, and the last course that we really wanna run in that phase two is a remote wilderness first aid of some sort, whether it be remote, whether it be advanced, uh, depending on the age of the audience, we would we would shape it that way. But something to make sure that they are ready to respond 
when we move to phase three. And if you can click on phase or click to the next clicky, <laughs> there we go. Um, when we look at phase three, this is now one night a week is now running in the villages. And now we go one weekend a month as well. So we have training aids and performas. The next slide actually will show that, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, that'll actually show uh, them how to, the, all the factors and considerations that you need to think about when you're taking people out on the land to be able to create that sandbox of safety. Um, in phase three, uh, we the, the topics that are uh, held around circle, it, you know, it's often uh, respecting women, um, conversations around, around um, how our two spirit brothers and sisters were, um, were pushed away because of colonization, um, you know, conversations about how to support your, your bros or your family with, com with their own thoughts of suicide. How do we do those things? But we're, we're trying to get the information to the youth who are in the circles that are actually where these conversations are coming up. And then they can say, hey, you know, Waylon talked about that. You should go talk to Waylon, you know, go have a conversation with Waylon. And I talked to him about it too. And he taught me some stuff. It's about creating that intermediary, that peer support. And we didn't know what we were doing this at the time. We really had no idea. Um, and so another thing in this, uh, in this phase, we like to make sure that they learn how to coordinate weekends. Maybe they're just taking care of food. Maybe they're just taking care of um, firewood and, and the fire that weekend. Maybe they're the fire keeper, but they have a role and a job. And so they start to learn how to coordinate. Another thing we try to do in this phase is trail design, trail building, uh, as well as map and compass work. Um, be, both by day and by night, because harvesting mushroom out on the land with boats out here, all of these things, we never know how, um, how things can go. Um, and if you click on the last one for me, so now by this point, we've got one night a week running, one weekend a month running, a place that's safe, a place there's love. Um, this program, like I said, was focused on young men when it was developed. And there's there are women out there that are working on the women's version to whatever one night a week and one weekend a month looks like. So the work is happening. Um, and so as we as we get to phase four, though, what we uh, what we start to see or what we like to do is to build, build something, whether it be a sheltered fire pit, remote sheltered fire pit out on the land. Um, some of the youth in the channel and, and elders have recommended uh, a really cool way to build longhouse style sheltered fire pits. And so we're going to have the same sheltered fire pits that we already build. We can now put planks of Alaskan milled wood up on the sides and be able to take those down and move to the, the inlet locations the way New Channel used to go from the, the ocean, the beaches into the inlets. And so it's all, we're just at the infancy of all of this. And so, um, and now they're big enough to actually carry weight. So it's a lot, it's a lot easier. They're 20 years old, 23 years old, and they're getting bigger. Um, so one of the things, the reason why we like to do this as well is because in every nation, it's going to be a different way to build. And I don't, I don't want the youth having to navigate that. Do we talk to hereditary first? Do we talk to chief or will that offend chief and council? Or is it an elected governance system? Or is it a, um, uh, is it a treaty government? Uh, is the land treaty settlement? Do we need to go to the lands department? All of these questions I support with because the youth want to build, they want to contribute, they can write grants, they can write them and they can do it. They can coordinate helicopters, bringing in supplies while boats later on that afternoon, bring in supplies. I, I've seen it. I mean, we did it in 20, what year are we in? 2021. <laughs> it was only last year. And so they are capable if we stretch them and put them in those positions where, where they can actually be supported to learn. And so um, this phase four piece uh, that we like to do, it's really driven by community. We've built fish processing areas in the villages uh, or uh, smoke houses in the villages because they were requested. Whereas in other nations, we've built sheltered fire pits or cabins across the lake to be able to uh, create field stations out on the land so the youth can get back out there. The way the warrior model has worked is we paddle in a canoe and we beach it 
and we cut into the bushes with machetes and we camp there that Friday night. And then the next day we clear an area and we set up our fire pit. And then the next day and, and maybe some more camping area. And then we pack up and go home on Sunday. But then the next time we go out the next month, we contribute more, we build more trails, more accessibility. We make it what it used to be. The boys make it what it used to be again. They And safe enough to bring elders out again, and then the elders can guide more, right? And so that's where this has been really the groundswell from the young people to do this. And so to know that it's possible, they can inspire each other. Um, next slide, please. Here's an example of the uh, overnight trip planner. I just picked page five, no reason. Um, the trip planner kind of shows, you know, meals and snacks, uh, shelter, accommodation, uh, poo plan, right? Where are we going to go? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> um, no, never mind. Um, medical facility, uh, you know, those types of things. What are the personal gear that we need to, to bring out, right? Um, those are the types of things that we want them to be thinking about. And if we can give them a pro forma that they can just, it helps them to be planning. And I don't know if it's just what I've heard from Nuchanov, but apparently boys aren't taught this at a young age. I wasn't. Um, apparently young ladies are taught this at a very young age. Uh, I don't know why that happens. Boys, uh, including myself, until I joined the military back when I was uh, stupid, um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I ended up, uh, yeah, we never learned this stuff. And so what this has been modeled after, these overnight trip planners, they've actually been modeled at how I used to uh, uh, teach my junior leaders to lead out on the land, the factors and considerations and how you can do that. Um, oh, I see. Sorry, I shouldn't. I get distracted by shiny things and something. Anyway, everybody else saw it too. Um, and so uh, the... We try to give them these performers so they can start to plan and start to use them to be able to create that sandbox out there. Um, they are modeled after the exact, so search, so it's modeled after SMESC, which is the same, so situation, mission, execution, service and support, and command and signals. This is the same thing that all emergency services use in some format or another. Everything from search and rescue to Parks Canada, uh, to um, the RCMP, to uh, the, the military. Everyone uses a model similar to this. And so they're we trick them. They don't know this. I hope none of them are watching. I guarantee none of them are watching. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, um, but we're tricking them into learning how to do this. So that way they're transferable skills for the future when they get into their late 20s and they're being hired by Parks Canada or other people that we that they get headhunted by it's what happens they get pulled into these organizations because it's because they have such great skills next slide please i think it's a the last video that i'm going to show and then i'll grab control of the slides again if possible so i don't have to keep doing this uh so here's what the program has grown into today the young people uh the youth the only reason i continue to do this is because they are coming to teach it with me why would i possibly want to continue to do this i wasn't the right person to do it from the from back in 2015 with our health director there. This is for the young people and they are coming with me to learn how to do it. FNHA is supporting that to happen um, and being able to bring these youth to other nations to inspire each other. And I'm just the background person that makes sure that you know the right conversations are happening and that people are, are, are being valued and, and that we're looking after one another. Um, but I try to stay in the woods. That's Let's, you brought me out of the woods for this one. Um, so here's the video. This is what we are. This is 2021 after we've now created this one year model. And uh, um, yeah, and now this is what we're going for or trying out. Here you are. Yo, yo, yo. Right now we're on Nettle Island close to Yukulit and we're here training for the Warriors program. Well, it's like a leadership program, so you're here to become leaders. You're, it's like um, this program where you're changing from youth to a young man. 
This year we're trying a new approach that uh, brings together the teams for uh, a training gathering at the start and at the finish so they can come together. And uh, we're basically running through a uh, variety of different activities and, and survival activities, wellness conversations, and, and also team building activities that, uh, that'll prep them and support them to be able to run the program back in their community. We needed to identify a few young people to take on the lead uh, in exercising this program. And so right away some names came to the surface and there were these young boys that uh, we identified. The process that we asked Ricardo to go through was to talk to the parents first and ask, like, explain the program to the parents and uh, ask them permission to come. So the, all of the youth that are here are here knowing that this is something that their parents would love for them to do. For me, how I see it is we're, we're planting the seeds in, into, into learning these skills and they'll be able to pick and choose which skill set they want to focus on. So when we do start our weeknight training and our weekend training, they'll already have an idea of what to do and they'll be able to learn from the mistakes that they've made here and the mistakes that they'll continue to make. There's three of us from Cayucid, so what I want to do is each of us brings back something, so that way it's not all on your shoulders, that way you can spread it out between the three of you. It was really hard at the first first bit. It's getting easier now, it's, it's definitely uh, now that I talk to ask help and questions and such. I feel like the community likes to see kids out there and likes to see us taking kids out there. I, I, I mean, who, who wouldn't want to see kids out here, right? Yeah, just like, just seeing kids run around and have fun. It just makes you happy. <laughs> well, the way we do it, and like Ricardo has taught me and the way that I'm hoping to do it is like you're creating a position for yourself to, not for yourself, you're creating a position that can be handed off where it's not like just meant for you and you're you're mentoring the youth with with the things that you know so that they can be a better coordinator than than you are and and hoping that and and creating an environment that that will will last forever in, in the community with what we're doing they're they're not only um learning that but they're developing their own confidence in being able to lead and finding it in themselves that it's, uh, it's okay to take your time to figure it out, to become that leader. I really appreciate this because it's given me so many opportunities to try something and not feel crazy, crazy pressure or backlash if it doesn't work out. All of the work that happens in Young Warriors is very preventative. It's very proactive, it's very uh, targeted towards uh, building up people from the inside out. You know, we used to uh, you know, barter and trade with our, with our, with our, neighboring, with our neighboring tribes. Um, now, now we're bartering and trading knowledge. And it'll help bridge that gap now that it's, that's, been, that's been passed on to us. Um, and we can become a closer New Channel community again. When they leave, actually tomorrow, um, they're going to go back home to their own communities and their families and they're going to share their experience and the other people are going to see just how much they've grown in this, uh, in this short period of time. So I think that's a big part of what, what it's all about. Here. Where I see this going forward is that soon enough we will have warriors that can stand up in the community and say, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. This is what I believe in. This is what I want to do. They'll be clear about who they are and about what they're here for and what they want to do with that. Through all these uh, relationships with the people that I've met and like developed, it made it easier for me to understand what kind of relationships I want to develop with all my friends and whatnot. They're like, we're all here for each other and we can go farther if we lift each other up rather than tear each other down to get ourselves ahead, I suppose. I, 
uh, I really appreciate um, you know being able to show these videos because it it sets the context a lot better than me rambling on um, in and trying to share just just the impact of uh, of what all of you know like I started at the beginning it's I'm just lucky um, I today where we've come to and and uh, how some of our our friends kind of define our work or talk about this work is that it provides those four things, hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose. I'm so uh, lucky to be able to work with uh, such cool uh, leaders from across the province, just trying to do cutting edge work, you know, trying to bring knowledge to community in a different way that's not so systems driven. Uh, and so that's that's where this program has really started to grow and and this is why the youth now, we started with one, uh, we have 120 plus young people in New Channel territory that come together, young men, and the women's programs are building in, in, in locally in communities. Uh, and hopefully in time, they'll form their collective as well. And so this, the model, one night a week, one week and a month, um, what we've found is the youth are actually capable and intelligent. Yeah. I don't mean to sound so surprised, um, but a lot of adults are quite surprised when they can do things, when they can, my youth know how to use a hill drill and an Alaskan mill. I don't yet. <laughs> they have to teach me. Uh, so those are the things that, that they can, they can learn. They're capable. They're intelligent young people, you know, with, uh, with time and the love that we've shown them, um, they, they, they can now safely run chainsaws. They can operate the boat to get out on the land. They can build something with the carpentry skills that they've had in remote places out on the territory because of what we've been able to do. They can even call together a group of older youth to build with them as one. And so this is why we, we, we wanna to continue to grow. Um, they, they continue to grow this and, and um, throughout that process, um, our values started to emerge. You know, um, there were so many pieces that we wanted to bring back um, about creating that sandbox of safety where the youth and that knowledge could actually transfer between each other. Um, the three kind of pillars of our program, um, provide, protect, prepare, right? Um, we, we were able to, uh, to provide food for the villages in different ways, whether it be um, you know, some of our snorkel harvester work or whether it be fishing for salmon. We're able to protect those resources, that being going out. Uh, we've gone out to Effingham, which is a oyster and clam bed, and, um, and we've seen them dug down, dug deep. And if anyone knows anything about those, they shouldn't be dug. You, you don't dig down when you're on a clam garden. You dig across. That way you're not harming the, the actual land there that they need to, to grow. And we need, so what we weren't out there enough to be able to protect those resources back then. And so we try to visit there more often now and get out there to protect those resources and keep an eye on it. Yes, we're, we're just youth right now, but this program has naturally become a feeder program into the guardians. And the last one is prepare. Prepare for so many different reasons. Prepare uh, for the fact that it's snowing right now in Tofino. Um, prepare for, uh, the, the eventual wave that will come towards us. Uh, prepare for the fires that are in some of the territories. I saw Lilwad already, you know, Buckshot. Thanks for lending us Buckshot. Um, and so, you know, prepare for the fires and, and the freshets that come. This is what they're there to do, to be able to, to support when that happens. And I always thought we were, I always, I always thought I was crazy, but then COVID came. And they started to call on the young people in Falkwia to guard checkpoints. They started to call on, uh, uh, they started to ask them to harvest seal and, tut and sea urchin, tutsip, uh, sea urchin and other foods. They asked them to distribute food. When the large food orders came in, they were then redistributing food for the village, right? And delivering that food to the village. And so they were actually utilized because they were a resource that could be utilized in those situations and and just like they traditionally would have helped they're prepared to do it and so that that kind of drove the those are the the 
that's what's been driving the program over the last few years. And we follow the seasonal calendar uh, to be able to get out there. Everyone has that seasonal calendar, but the most important part is that we follow those teachings as well. So we go out to harvest cedar in May, but have learned from the elders that that's when respecting women and the givers of life was taught. And so we teach that again. We talk about that again. We host that conversation again to make sure. And every year it becomes deeper, bigger. We bring more into it, but that's, we want to follow those teachings. There was a time of year when the coming of age ceremonies happened. It's coming up. And so we want to follow that again when we're trusted and when communities know that we're here to help and support and the youth are coming and asking them, they're not afraid to share. And that's the biggest piece that sometimes holds up the programs is that um, there's a fear uh, around uh, some of that. And that's completely understandable. But at the same time, the um, uh, to be able to get back out there and knowing why we want them, why, why we want to go back out there is uh, it's always it's always a great um, conversation that the youth have in each of the villages. Um, what we've seen uh, over the last, I guess, three years we've been trying now, uh, working at it, uh, is to get high school accreditation. Uh, as of last June, right, because the end of school year, um, uh, school district for Cayucat, uh, school district up there, uh, they have accepted warrior curricula uh, for grade 10, 11, and 12 credits. So we're really lucky, really, um, uh, really happy that they that that ed, that education is being valued because it's not fun out there. They go out and build things. They go out and learn things, and they're tired and they're uncomfortable at night. And so they should earn credits for doing what they're doing because they're rebuilding communities for their nation. They're rebuilding places to go, called places of he. Here's one on the uh, <laughs> on the screen right now. This is Ukmin. It's a traditional garden of the Tlalquia people for the last millennia, and uh, actually two millennia. But um, last summer, 2021, uh, Hayden Seacher, the coordinator, you saw him in one of the videos there talking about trying to create something better for his youth. Um, he raised the money and uh, was able, he was the only application approved out of 84 on Vancouver Island, this young man, 19 when he wrote it. And he raised the money to build a cabin and a sheltered fire pit and then coordinated it that summer. Helicopter movement, uh, boats coming in with supplies. And now they, they, we have this location that the youth can come out to and the community can sign out and use. They can go there and with their family and heal whatever they need to do. Um, what we started to also find uh, is that relevant training. We had to keep up with our training and, and making sure that it was relevant to what was going on. So here's an elder and our young people learning naloxone, uh, having naloxone training. Um, the young people are the ones in the circles that are going to have to, that these things happen. Not me. They can come in like, the, none of us are. And so we need to give the training to the youth, the older youth that will respect it. You can see some others in the background there. Yes, we take the younger ones and they go and have a wiggle walk. We take them out to go play something, right? But at the have this, we we aren't afraid to have these conversations because because the people are dying. And so this uh, relevant training, different things that we can do. We we work on we work with our channel tribal council dietitian. Um, oh, I think I'm freezing. That's okay. Um, we work with our NTC dietitian to uh, come up with uh, new recipes, fish tacos, healthy eating, power balls, things like that. So trying to find a way to weave in all the resources that we already have. My work with Chimamo is any opportunity we can to remove those barriers. If we can remove the barriers, here's a young man, uh, his name is Liam. Here's Liam. At 10 years old, getting a carving set. We buy a $38 carving set to give to the youth when they come to training gathering one. We have canoe races. I actually, <laughs> I put the canoes on the side here. They had canoe races. It was awesome. Um, and so just imagine a 10-year-old boy getting a carving set. And in 15 years, at 25, he has the potential to be a master carver. 
if he applies himself, if he falls in love with it, young man did. And so a $38 carving set, that's not, there's no way that could be on the priority list for his parents. But if we can remove that barrier through funding that we can raise collective as one new channel, this, this is what it's about, right? A place to see what they were good at. And this is, this is, this is what this young man is good at. It was natural and he didn't stop. We had circle and he just kept on carving. <laughs> so removing those barriers is such a, uh, an important piece to any program that you create in your village. Um, something that started to happen naturally uh, was collective training. The youth wanted to come together. They wanted to do things together to learn together, but also to play together. And so training opportunities each year. Uh, one of them is called uh, Warrior Games. Warrior Games happens in the spring. Um, this is when we bring all the new channel nations that are part of this program together uh, to be able to uh, compete. Compete in the games, I've been told, uh, they're topati, they're, they're games they would show their worthiness to their uh, wife's family, their partner's family, to show their worthiness, their strength. And so we, there were games like log balance, there's archery, there's canoe race, there's different things that they do went to their elders to ask what we traditionally played to bring those back. And so next year, there's a couple other games that we're going to bring in, but it continues to grow being driven by the young people. Uh, you can see over on the right, we use that location that Hayden built in 2021, um, that Hayden brought a team together to create. And there's some lights plugged into a generator that we had a sheltered fire pit to use at night with the youth in May. May long weekend is when Warrior Games happens, if anybody wants to come on out. Um, Warrior Cup is the second gathering that we do in the fall. And this one was driven by the youth again when they said, Ricardo, we want to race go-karts. I'm like, oh, well, well, I guess I'll find out about that. And, and went and did some digging. And so uh, we've had two now, two Warrior Cups, uh, everyone from young people all the way up to elders racing go-karts uh, in Parksville. But again, being driven by the young people as opportunities that they have to earn. This isn't a high school program. It's based on merit. You have to earn your right to go to these things because you have to contribute to the team. You have to, you heard Lindsay in the first video. I learned to, to not to sit by the fire when I'm supposed to be working. Exactly. That's what we want to remind them to do. It's what it used to be, right? Even yesterday we heard when they would look to see if anyone needed help down by the water and then they would go bring those groceries up. I always hear that, that teaching and I really, I love when we do and I love when different elders are telling us that because it means that one of these times it'll sink in and the, 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 right, the youth will grab it. So um, again, Warrior Cup driven uh, by the youth. We meet in the fall and, uh, and have some fun. Oh, there is the Warrior Cup. Uh, I put Skittles in it. Uh, <laughs> there you are. Um, community building projects is another thing that we started to see uh, emerge out of all this. And the youth, again, are capable. They built this smokehouse. They actually, they built three out of four. That's a smokehouse built in Huwaya territory in Anakla, uh, two in lower Anakla, two in upper Anakla. And so these are the types of things that, uh, that the youth are able to actually create. They're tall enough. They're strong enough. We bring in a carpenter, a Red Seal carpenter from North Island College or uh, a local or even if it's not, it doesn't always have to be, but someone to teach them these skills. And what we've seen is they're getting transferable skills that they can use because they're in that, I just finished high school and I'm not sure what to do, but I just want to do something. I don't want to sit. And sometimes they want to sit and we have to kind of push them. That's what, that's where, that's where moms come in too. Um, I wanted to show this one as well, this, a, uh, a smokehouse that was built in Tauqu or in um, Itatsu in uh, Uplutha territory um, by James and Hayden uh, and Tyson Tucci. They, they built a smokehouse and this one was actually a request from the village. The village, the elders said that this lady, Brenda, another elder, she um, makes, she does fish for all of the elders. And so they collectively asked for help. There's Brenda. We showed up one day and Brenda actually stays in her smokehouse now more than in her own house. Uh, she likes to sit in there. And, uh, and so again, community driven projects. Uh, here was the building project that Hayden led. That's the cabin build. And you saw the sheltered fire pit outside. Um, again, they're capable. Uh, something that uh, as we started to grow, as we started to see this, the youth wanted to come together also to plan. And so 
we bring our youth together, our youth leaders, our co community coordinator and our youth leaders together uh, every uh, six months to plan together and have different activities there that they can bring back to their village. So that way they're not always having to come up with new activities. We're supporting them to learn. So here's Leonard, you know, beating his first feather, right? Uh, we do breath work. We do, uh, what did we just do at our last one? We did uh, tracks and signs. We did how to set up a hammock, right? Those are the types of skills that are actually important. Um, we started to also now move into collective training courses, like creating our own courses that are needed. So during the start of COVID, uh, Ukulele First Nation asked if uh, we could learn how to harvest um, uh, seafood and so we worked with Bottom Dwellers uh, Freediving to create a course that uh, allows you to go to five meters in depth, which is half an atmosphere. So it doesn't really, really, really hit you on the ears and the other parts that get and the sinuses, but they're able to harvest at a low tide things like tootsip, sea urchin. Uh, um, they wouldn't harvest a giant Pacific octopus, but there's a, a GPO, I've heard it's called, cool, um, uh, that the youth were able to see and, and see in their environment. Now this is school happening. So a snorkel harvester course that we bring to the village and now there's a team of four that can harvest in each of the villages at the, at the right tides, which we just passed, right? Because they can get to that low tide and harvest scallops, sea urchin, um, high stoop, high stoop, high stoop, uh, chitons, that's what they're called, chitons, um, and, uh, and other types of, and crabs at that depth as well. Um, we have worked with uh, really cool partners like Outward Bound. Uh, if you're interested in work with Outward Bound at all, um, there's there's some really cool projects that they're now working on with Indigenous communities. Um, and so just give me a heads up and I can put you in contact with that person. But um, we were able to bring an Outward Bound canoe guiding course uh, to the all of the nations to be able to do a multi-nation trip. And now the uh, youth that attended are taking it back out to their villages and offering a course up there. There's one coming to Cayuca, just in case, uh, just if you don't know yet, uh, the youth are working on it with Aaron, uh, the, the instructor. So being able to lead these things back in their own villages, being able to bring these skills back home is so important, right? It takes initiative as well. It takes that, that the right people, the right youth that, are, that believe in something, in creating something different, to, to turn a page, to create a different chapter. Um, where we've now moved to in uh, in a lot of our work is food sovereignty, food security. Um, oh, I spelled archery wrong. Ta -da. I'll point everybody out. There you are. Um, so uh, running a community level archery program. We worked with BC Archery to be able to create a program that's uh, that feeds in because there was a gap. They didn't have anything that fed into our amateur level archery, which led into professional archery. So they created a program and we piloted it with the Warriors last spring or last fall, like this October that just passed, uh, to run a community level archery range. So the youth are now qualified, the older youth are qualified to run an archery range near their village. Um, and so these are the types of skills that lead back, feed right back into food sovereignty and food security. Um, some of our future projects, kind of where we're going with all of this, uh, is seafood gardens, clam gardens. Um, We've learned that uh, there's so much food out there uh, within these clam gardens uh, that we just need to love them. We need to look after them. And so we are working on an initiative with you, Vic, uh, and uh, the Jane Goodall Institute to try to support clam garden rebuilding, seafood garden rebuilding in the nations, uh, in the New Channel nations to, to create that food source uh, that we're going to need as prices continue to rise. Um, I'll share some of the observations and learnings. Uh, I think it's important. Um, and then, you know, we'll open it up for some questions. Uh, the warrior coordinator role. So that young person, the coordinator role is really an 18 to 25 year old that holds the position for two years. And then we bring the next person in in succession and train them how to job. The reason why we do that is they get picked off anyway. They get hired by the guardian program in the village. They get hired by lands and resources. They get hired by health and wellness department. And, and so we might as well prepare for that by having a succession plan of leaders. And I can't tell you the number of times, well, actually it's been three, so it's not that many times, but enough times that when I tell a young person, hey, so this is how it works, 
they ask, they, they confirm, you mean I'm going to get to lead this someday? Yes. It's not a job that you have forever. It's based on handing it over. It's based on training the next person to have an easier job than you did, right? And so that's the warrior coordinator role. Adult mentors. There's a gap that we find in nations with adult mentors often that they don't see the value that they bring. They don't know that they still have so much to teach. You see Uncle Ray in the video and, and he didn't know his 40 years of search and rescue and time as a fire chief and, uh, and time as a logger and all of those would still bring value. And so coming and spending time, a couple of youth grab on and they start to learn. And you saw him the first times he was learning how to do the rope. I saw all the videos. So that's the, the, the opportunity for, for adults. Sometimes they don't even know they can teach anymore. They don't think they can teach in that bigger environment, but it's possible. And we create smaller groups that teach and learn out on the land, right? They call them stations. We call it a round robin back in our day. Um, that's the adult mentors. Uh, this programming, like I've talked about, young, women, young women's programming uh, is being developed uh, in its own way. Um, there's a team at the Indigenous Youth uh, Wellness, the Indigenous Youth Wellness team. Uh, they're working on a, a, a women's version to this. Um, and so it's different. We don't know what it looks like, um, but it, it, it needs to be shaped that way. The other piece that we've learned is that the, the genders were taught separately. So uh, we have a space that's for young men and anyone that identifies as male. So it's open to our two spirit brothers and sisters as well. And so this is something that, um, that we really, uh, the, the, the women's programming uh, is being driven by women. Something we realize in our, our men's work is that, uh, in the young men's work, is that we actually need aunties out on the land with us. We need aunties to come and teach the and with us and bring that balance to us that as men, that we don't like, yeah. It, so I don't know if that's the same thing for young women's programming, if they need uncles out there on the land. And so we know as young, young men, I know as, as an adult man, it's it, we need aunties there to, to love these boys with us. They need that, that they need all the love that we can give them. Um, and so uh, the last one I want to share is uh, Facebook. Um, if any of you ever look at our Facebook site, Youth Nations Warrior Program, Youth Nations Warriors, yeah, something like that. I don't like Facebook. And I, I don't think it does anything really that is healthy for anyone that that's a part of this. Come out on the land with us. Come and see it. If you need support, come and like we we figure that piece out. But the the it's not. I haven't seen it lead to very much healthy things. Very many healthy things. I have seen success with posting a video, right? But but your idea is going to be in its incubator, and it can be broken apart and pulled down at any moment. And so I I really. We're not, I'm not very good with the Facebook piece um, because I'm always in the woods with young people teaching and learning and, and doing stuff out there. And so um, I encourage you to call, um, text, uh, emails even, but it's just, uh, it's social media these days. Uh, I find that our youth spiral too much when they have to, when they're there. Uh, so we use messenger and things like that, but the social media piece has been a real um, struggle well, not really struggle, but we just don't have the, yeah, the value there that we see. Next steps, um, provincially. So uh, I was told by a couple of my colleagues, Jessica, one of them, that I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm going to burn out from the amount that I put into these uh, boys. And, you know, uh, so I had to try to find a way to create something that would help us to be able to, to support provincially. So we've been working with partners, look, working with different people to try to create a a larger level for the warrior family that could support this work provincially. My youth are starting to take over some of these roles that can, that, that are a part of our family tree. Um, and so, uh, you know, locally within uh, each of the nations, you, the, the youth, they're starting to, they're, they're, they're still preserving, they're drying things, they're smoking clams and smoking fish. Um, they, they're working on construction projects for the future, um, you know, and, and our values continue to form, right? This is a safe place to fail and not be made fun of, uh, where you can 
actually do things without risk and and be watched and and others can watch it's a circle where the voice of the youngest person you know matters most and guides the program um individually we see that the youth seem to want to be a part of this for some reason they want to go out in the rain and now the snow uh and and uh and be a part of this with us um it's taken a lot of uh persistence and a lot of rain gear uh for us to be able to get out there but it's really been like paddling in the fog um the start of this program i feel it's always really really essentially important that people understand that the start of this program Three years ago, James told me, you know, Ricardo, <laughs> the only reason I ever came is because my mom forced me. And I said, huh, well, that's interesting, James, because you know the only reason I came? Every night, every Monday night, because our program was one night a week, one weekend a month. It was Monday nights we met in Itatsu. And, uh, and I would drive through the Long Beach low ground by Talquiet there. And uh, where you lose cell reception and, and I'd wonder, you know, what am I doing? What am I doing? And I would get home and my wife would say, does James keep going? And I'd say, yes. And then she'd say, You'd have, then you have to keep going. And so it's really, really important that everyone knows this program was started by two mothers that wanted something different for their boys. You know, we have three young boys that don't have a place where they can fail and not get made fun of, where they can be loved unconsequentially by their bros out there on the land. And, you know, we're really lucky that this continues to spread, but the reason it's been like paddling in the fog is because we've been listening to the youth voice and they didn't trust us for the first few years. Now, they trust us and the fog is lifting and they tell us what they want to do and, and there isn't hesitation. But then we also hold them accountable to put the energy behind what they ask us to do. And so this program, I'm really lucky to be here. I'm really, I'm, I'm not even sure uh, how I ended up on this call with you all today. Um, but I, I really, uh, I'm honored to do the work that I do for, for the communities that I get the, the blessing to work with. Um, so I think I'll open it up to questions um, because I want to stop talking and I'm sure everybody wants me to stop talking. You did amazing, Ricardo. It's really awesome to hear about the program and um, all the cool things that you um, built to develop it. And um, yeah, we have a few questions here. Uh, I'll just open up the question page. Uh, does the warrior camp operate during the winter time or year round? Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, we were in frost and ice last week. We find ways to do it. Um, we use wall tents now, even because we're at that that stage, right? Um, so we our you our coordinator, twenty one year old young man Leonard Nukemus in Huaya territory, set up two wall tents and a uh, another uh, shelter over top of the fire, so we could go out on the land two weekends ago. So it's it's yes, it's rainy <laughs> or snowy. But yes, we operate all year round because we follow the seasons and we need to know those locations in all of the seasons. That's the teaching. We need to know the plant in every season before we harvest from it, because we need to know what it needs before we harvest, before we take, we need to know it. And so we do go in every season. Well, that's also, awesome. yeah, next question. Um, Someone was wondering if they can contact you about the group or observing the camps, like organizing a youth wellness trip for the summer. And um, they would like to ask to do this with like the planning. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's cool. I've never, yeah, that's, uh, you know, we'll obviously go through everything we need to, to like checks and things like that for them, um, like adult buys and things. But if you wanted to bring some youth to check it out, we can find an opportunity to do that. Uh, it's always, I always ask permission of my young people because it's their territory that they're hosting the gatherings. So, you know, that's the the piece that, but I'm, they're usually pretty cool about meeting new people. So yes, absolutely. And uh, I don't, my contact information somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can post it if that's okay with you. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Oh. And then, um, 
Has there been any exploration of offering camps for youth in the more urban areas like Victoria or Vancouver? Yes. Um, so, so what we want, so not, I, I haven't had anyone that um, to like, uh, and maybe after this call, we'll have some people that are willing to support that. Um, and I would love to find a way. Um, conversations we've been having even in the downtown east side uh, is to take them to the North Shore. Just get them to the North Shore. Uh, and that's their first step, grouse grind. Well, maybe not the grind, but you know, <laughs> maybe take the gondola up, <laughs> but uh, but get them there. And then to Pemberton, right? And my ultimate hope is, imagine if it's a multi-nation crew that's in, say, Port Alberni or uh, in Vancouver or Nanaimo, why not go to where those youth are from? When, the, when you know, so we would welcome, like the Nuchanoth would welcome out to the, this territory here, um, all of the youth from downtown east side, for example. Uh, same thing with Lillowat. I know there's uh, work on the Lillowat Outdoor School that we might be able to host them up there. And so being able to go out to those locations. Um, my dream is to have uh, Ministry of Child and Families uh, send a bus from Victoria, picking up all the youth that belong to Huayat or the southern region and just end up in Huayat and have our southern region gathering. Why can't they? Why can't they bring the people home? Why can't they bring those young people home? There's, the gap is that they may not be ready to go on the land because being dropped into the wood line is not always a good thing, but we can come to the urban centers and start to develop them there. We're, we're getting to that place, I think, where with the allies that may be on this call and things like that. So, yeah. Does that answer that? Yeah, I would say so. Um, and the next question is, could you talk a little more about how you went about securing funding? Mm. Um, so I'd be happy to share grants um, that we've been successful for because we kind of had to show that there was a, um, a want for it uh, at first in general. We didn't know. So for the first six years, like I said, we, um, we applied for neurodust and civil forfeitures and uh, anyone that really would listen to us. Um, and the, the tipping point for us, once we knew the youth wanted it and we started to see it growing roots, strong roots, um, we approached, well, that was when Coral approached FNHA uh, and First Nations Health Authority through their mental health and wellness dollars, their MOU funding there, that uh, um, tripartite agreement uh, that's accessed through health centers, mm -hmm. health departments. That's how we were able to secure consistent operational funding. Um, uh, capital funding uh, for material costs, such as building expenses, or if we need to buy like a, I don't know, a chainsaw, right? Anything over $1,500, right? Mm -hmm. um, those capital expenses, uh, we have found uh, uh, grants that would support those specifically, because you, you can't, we can't, uh, as a part of the FNHA funding, it's operational. Um, and so we aren't able to use it for material costs. The other thing that we've now been able to do, we set up the Warrior Fund, which is surprising. Um, uh, it's a place where uh, people can do partner that's been working with us, um, the Clackwatt Biosphere Trust. They, they were the ones who supported that initiative back in 2018 with Parks Canada that you saw on the video. And so um, uh, we've been able to set up a fund for that as well. And they are, um, uh, that allows us to buy gear for a young person and they can keep it or buy a sh buy the the a the tin roof we need for a sheltered fire pit because the rest of it we can harvest but the you know there's things like that so that's where um those are three funding sources we've been able to use um grants fnha's uh mou uh, mental health and wellness and then the um uh warrior fund charitable which isn't very big but it's something yeah, thank you. And um, someone was asking, um, when you have young people that are still active in abuse, uh, substance abuse, how do you keep them involved with some things that may need to be substance free? That is a, um, that's a great question. We set boundaries and they, they aren't allowed to be there. They're running chainsaws. They're being asked to 
you know, the amount of things that they're being asked to do out on the land, we have to trust one another. And that's a part of all this, right? Um, and so uh, it's, it is a, it's a part of the economy that the youth have put in place with one another. And so that is addressed within youth to youth, actually, because of the way the system has been like self-created. It's a place where they don't have that. It's a place where they can avoid that, where their tent's not going to smell like that, right? Sometimes we see that their clothes still smell and there's, and we still ask the questions about what's going on. And then they're, they, but we still ask those questions. So no, very, very great question about that. It's, we have to set the boundaries because of safety. Uh, it's also another thing about, um, that's why it's important to have one night a week because one night a week is when they earn their, they show respect, responsibility, and self-discipline to be able to go out on the land. So if they can behave and listen to an elder as they teach, right? Or as we learn to make drums, or as we learn to carve a knife sheath uh, with a Zoom call with Buckshot, um, then they can be trusted to go out on the land. And then when they're out on the land, they can watch the fire at first, or help with dinners and lunches at first. And then once they get they, they dial that in and they show respect and responsibility and self-discipline there. Then they go out on hunts, our elders, our, our adult mentors that are hunters and things like that. So there's a merit-based approach on the land. Thank you. Um, our next question is, if the youth coordinator role is two years, do they have 16 or 17-year-old youth sh shadowing them? Yes. Oh, I didn't put it on my thing. Um, but the, the, the way the model works is um, the youth, uh, there's a, a, that 18 to 25 year old, right? Because um, sometimes they get in late, you never know, right? It's fine. Um, they will have junior leaders under them, well, above them, actually. That's, we actually turn the organizational chart on its head. Um, I don't, I'm not going to share my screen. I'll, it'll take too long to pull it up, probably. But um, we... So the community coordinators at the bottom of the, they hold everyone up. Above them are their, their youth leaders who are, in, who are responsible for six to eight young people out on the land. There's a chain of command, if you want to call it that. I hate using those words, but there's a, a grooming that's happening naturally um, for uh, in the process as it goes along. So there are already 17 and 16 year olds that are in there um, and they have a, another person, their sidekick, second command, who's there to, to support them as well. So everyone has a teammate. Uh, and that's how this program uh, continues to grow is because they want to keep going in the rain. I am so surprised. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and the next question is, Elder storytelling, is that a part of the warrior initiative? Mm. That is that is all we want to do. We want to create a place that the elders can teach again and where the youth have some discipline and pay attention and make eye contact and don't look at their phones and don't run around or climb the bleachers, right? Um, the core of this program are those teachings. Um, the leadership teachings from the village are the teachings that we want to support the youth to remember. Redistribute wealth, respect, right? Everything is one. So those are the, we want them to be taught the right way, right and proper is what my elders have taught me, <laughs> in the right and proper way. And not, Western takes a back seat to everything that we're learning and, and, uh, you know, the teachings, don't miss the tide. The tide is out, the table is set, right? We'll be there. And so it is driven by by elders. Uh, and yeah. Cool. Um, this one's a long question. Um, the person appreciates f &H fostering the wellness esteem rising from this these bushcraft and survival skills, the gender and support. Does it also give space for transfer of cultural, spiritual teaching, such as reciprocal relationship to land and non-human persons? Mm, yes. Um, I touched on it a little bit earlier as well, too. Um, for example, even the plants. Giselle Martin um, from Tlalquiet is one of our, our uh, matriarchs, I would like to call her, even though she'll punch me. <laughs> um, but uh, she's only a few years older than me. But, uh, I, you know, she's really guided kind of uh, 
how we do it. And her teachings around, we need to know the plants for a full year before we think of taking from them, right? We knew the, we knew the place before we harvested and pulled from it. And so that's, you know, that's the core about this. We get out there first and, and learn to look after it first uh, before we, we, yeah, the stewards of the land piece that has kind of driven uh, the need for this out there. Um, thank you for that. And um, we have another question that says, how and when is the best time for a hat to set uh, to get along with, get going with the Warriors program? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Monique uh, Como is already kind of working uh, with Ethan Blackstone, like there we're so in January, um, we're driving up for an ICBC driving pilot initiative that we're doing out there. We're doing some local testing. Um, that's something I didn't cover on this call. ICBC, we've been working with them to uh, create a, a different approach to licensing in Indigenous communities. And we're piloting it in the, the, the Warrior Nations first to, again, check out gaps. We did phase one here a year and a half ago and now phase two. Um, and so we'll be driving through a uh, on uh, on that trip, and I would love to figure out how that could look. Um, you have my contact info. It's a, it's really been driven by. Uh, uh, I'm just I'm super humbled that people want us to come and fail in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. And then our last question is. In addition to the MOU funding from FNHA, you mentioned how much additional funding would be needed to fund a program to start? If FNHA supports you, that is pretty much enough money to start. I used to run this program on minimal, minimal dollars when I was writing grants, right? Um, and so if the FNHA, I will, I can support if you need me to talk with anyone or however that looks, I don't know how that all looks. I don't, uh, I, it needs to come from community. And so to talk about what it could look like with you first to just get a picture of it. And then we talk to, and I'll send you, I can share what I uh, created with Coral uh, that we submitted to FNHA. So you can take a look at it and, and steal whatever you want there. We don't, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, FNHA believes in what we're doing. Um, we're going to figure out a way to maybe even increase capacity in the future. I don't even know what that means. Um, but all I know is the young people uh, are getting ready. To, they are teaching it. They're already teaching it to other nations. We were out in Fountain with the Stoutlium Nation up there uh, a couple weeks ago, or no, about a month ago now, uh, doing a youth hunting camp just to kind of see if the youth want to go out. And they did. It was cold. For, for new channel and for Caribbean guys. Um, so yes, that's um, that's in addition to the, you don't need additional funding uh, in addition to FNHAs if we're able to get the same thing set up for your program. Um, it's more than I've ever dreamt that we would have to do this work. Was, again, like luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity and for eight years, like these boys have prepared and uh, now people believe in them. Uh, so it's really humbling to, you know, see that, hear that, be a part of this. Um, they're in a trauma-informed care workshop right now that I'm skipping. <laughs> so, you know, this is the stuff, right? We, we don't know what we're doing, but everyone can suggest uh, we're paddling in the fog. Um, every now and then uh, we bump into another island and the youth there say, hey, we want this too. And we're like, well, there's a lot of work involved. And they're like, okay. And so they start to carve their canoe. And now we've got seven nations, you know, paddling with us in New Channel, Statlium, the young man, uh, Shaka, it's, uh, those from Lilwat there. Shaka was out here on their trapper course last weekend. We just did a four-day trapper course as a part of what the nations are asking to remember. So uh, any other, I'll stop there. Any other questions, Serene? Just respect. No, that was the last question. Um, I just want to say thank you, um, Ricardo, and to everyone joining us today. And thank you so much, Ricardo, for the amazing discussion. It was great to see how the Warriors program started, how you sustain it, and how um, you get youth involved in um, wanting to be the successors for um, the program. 
And um, I'll just bring your guys' attention to, just before we end the webinar, I'd like to bring your attention to our up and coming webinars. We have Empowering Indigenous Subject Matter Experts Through Research with Christopher Horsey. That's on December 6th um, at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we have Indigenous Health and Climate Change Passing on Solutions with Deborah McGregor. That's on December 13th at 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And um, yeah, so sign up for our newsletter. The link will be in the chat. All these webinars are free to sign up for on our website and um, at www.learningcircle.ubc.ca. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at the next Learning Circle. Lim Lim, thank you. Bye.